Hello and welcome to my assignment for Module 3, Speaking to Diversity, Trauma-Informed Teaching. Thomas Bulger, student number 1903031. And now today I'm going to talk to you about the effect of trauma within the educational system as how we deal with teaching in an informed approach. First of all, what is trauma? Well, within the student body, you can have adverse childhood experiences. And these can take up physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual, domestic violence, parental, maybe there's addiction in the family, mental health, people who have passed on bereavement and or uh, people who are in prison, whose parents are in prison. Um, it can be an event that's experienced and the effects of that can create an impact on a person in that the post-traumatic stress or the trauma that they have can affect how they regulate within classes, how they emotionally or physically regulate in classes, um, and find it difficult, um, maybe become hypervigilant or maybe even withdrawn, um, unable to uh, read social skills. Anyhow, we have to work around those negative outcomes. Uh, the types of trauma, first of all, you have PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, where an extreme event, whether experienced or witnessed, can trigger stressful or incapacitating reactions. Now that's on the person subjectively. How people get that can get it in many different ways um, through intergenerational trauma, which for the majority of my student body, that would be maybe the um, main approach or main, main, main way that they will uh, get trauma. Uh, process of physical trauma pass, uh, passed on to communities and families. It can have a significant impact and can leave individuals far more open to further com uh, complications. And um, if you're vulnerable and if you're hurt, it, it lends it that you're open to far more uh, heightened experiences. And so therefore we have to be aware of our students, but also we have to be aware of uh, vicarious trauma. Because if I'm working with a child and I'm taking on board all of their uh, problems or, and I'm aware of all their problems and I'm not le and I don't have a, some sort of mechanism to stop that, and I'm going home and I'm getting to bed and I'm lying there and I'm looking at the ceiling and I'm worried and it's taken its mental health toll on me. Um, I have to be careful. As to say, in an airplane, you always put your own mask on first. You can't be the best that you can be or deliver a service to your students if you feel that you have that impact on yourself. Um, there, as Brunsel and et al. say, and I've also left a uh, link there for people to go and continue on if they want to get further information on that. My students, who are they? Well, they come from family disadvantaged, community disadvantaged, just maybe substance use, high criminality in the area, socioeconomically deprived. And with all of these, there is a higher propensity of maybe poor mental health, uh, low academic achievement. Also, you have to be aware that within the system that you might have poor teacher relationships and maybe teachers' capability to promote confidence is at a low. As far as Loftus links in, that all of this stuff can be addressed, but we must be aware of it. The story so far in my centre, in my centre we have a fairly trauma-informed uh, approach and practice. We have, as you can see here, um, absolutely we, we accept everybody and anybody without discrimination. It's very, very, very inclusive. We have chill-out areas, we have places where people can talk, where they can actually sit down and discuss with their key workers. We have breakfast clubs, and we have a rec room which is actually in the process of being built at the moment for pool and coffee making facilities and all that. The idea is to try and create a much more secure environment for somebody so that when they come in here that they can actually feel um, safe and so that they can learn and develop Piaget, Vygotsky, all the greats would say that within a secure base that's where you start learning, that's where you start being able to build up, that's where you have the confidence to build up on your uh, self-efficacy, your self-esteem and uh, all that happens in the secure base. Gilligan, 2014, talks about this in a, in a wide scope that um, you have to you have to provide a pure environment for which they can evolve. Many students come from adverse backgrounds. They need uh, security environmental in the classroom. O'Toole will also agree with that. Um, the activity that I was thinking of and did was to try and get a person to think positively about who they were and where they wanted to go. Because we all become aware of where we're from to where we are now, if you reflect and are aware. But that next jump onto the future, you need skills. You need to be able to 
promote yourself and understand and believe in yourself. And this is where a lot of my students may be lacking. So I want them to start thinking about their positivities, work on their strengths, um, and accept that they may need to have help and they may need to get help from other places. The activity itself, I decided because, it, well, a grateful board. I find that a grateful board was very, I know it's semantics, but I didn't want people to be grateful for what was actually their God-given right. I mean, why be grateful because you have food in your stomach or you have a roof over your head? These for children should be right. But I didn't want to get too political with the meter. So what I did was I broke it down to hopes, plans, positivity and wishes. Now, I started off with just a board and it could stick up a little sticky uh, uh, onto the board and write out their ideas or what they wanted to say or whatever. But it, it was, in fairness, it went to a poor reception. Um, as you can see on the, this board here, very, very limited to the amount of answers I got. So I brought them on board and used a Padlet because I was thinking, why are they not answering this stuff? And I realized that it was public. People could see their hand right and recognize what they were asking or whatever. So if I went Padlet, it allowed anonymity. It also allowed them to discuss at any stage. They didn't have to be in class when they were putting this stuff up. So I was getting suggestions and I was getting wishes and I was getting plans of what people wanted to do in the future. And what I could do then once a week, I would discuss this openly. We'd have an open forum and people could A, decline ownership of it so that they could talk about it subjectively, or B, get really in depth and get the font of knowledge off other people, their peers' experiences, maybe my guidance, maybe my my ideas of where they might not want to go, or maybe not take it on board at all, but it was their choice and they were self-led. Um, the second part with the Padlet, as you can see, that went really, really well, um, and we were able to discuss it. That would, would have happened maybe on a week basis, and at the start it was kind of it was a, a, a stronger impetus, Whereas now it's maybe once every 10 days or maybe once every two weeks that we discuss something new and we can discuss off the board what that person's thinking or where they're at and no one has to uh, be on the spotlight. Um, the board was positioned in the hall and again that was too, too, too public so the fact that it was up in, in the ether of the internet meant that the anonymity stayed. Uh, changing that format was also the fact that it they had a hidden agenda in that uh, a learning agenda that they also were learning more on UDL University Design for Learning. It was more technical and we're learning how to upload and we're learning how to search as well. The reaction itself going forward, as I've already discussed, um, it was really, really good, it was positive. And the, the, the main thing was it became self-led. So people were able to put up the subjects that they wanted to talk about. Now, obviously, with a certain appropriateness, but it meant that if there was anything to worry, which hasn't happened yet, but I'd be able to give guidelines and directions and refer them to maybe a place where they needed to go. Um, the exercise repeated, successful with the older groups actually, maybe it was the fact that they had more experience or maybe they were more vocal or maybe they were more comfortable because they've been here longer. Um, we also got sometimes expletives within the format, um, which was funny, like, you know, the, the lesser ones would be, I want to be a DOS or I want to be a Raver. But they were discussed just as much because when somebody's saying stuff, even if it's not complying with what you want them to say or need them to say, it needs to ask a question, needs to be addressed. Now, clearly, all of this was delivered and explained with professional boundaries and the understanding of duty of care. Thanks very much.